Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, Senior English A, and our objective now for the hour, and you should have your annotations in front of you, I hope that you do, is to uh, what I will call now walk through the end of Hamlet. Uh, there is some irony that I would use that language, because from about Act, four, um, act four on, Hamlet is really nothing more than what it's probably been from the beginning, a play of death. That is to say, to be or not to be. But the death starts to become increasingly more apparent. First with the death of Polonius. Secondly with the death of Ophelia, self-inflicted death of Ophelia. But before we get to Ophelia's suicide, we must get to Ophelia's loss of psyche. And let's go ahead and say it now. Uh, Polonius will have said earlier, what is it to be able to define madness but to be mad? In other words, sorry, Mr. Tonkovich and all teachers of psychology, the present lecturer included, you got to be insane to talk about insane people. To try to define insan insanity or madness is itself um, an insane or a maddening enterprise. Why? Uh, because there are just so many levels to insanity. Uh, however, Ophelia really has lost her mind. When she comes on stage, I want to say two things about Ophelia coming on stage. We're now in 4-5. When Ophelia comes on stage, two things. One, uh, other than the obvious deportment in terms of the way she looks, she looks nuts. Just like when Hamlet came on, uh, on stage looking nuts, his hair is all gone crazy, he's dressed strangely, etc., etc. When Ophelia comes on stage, she also has that. But two things. One, she's carrying flowers most of the time. Now, this will be a return to the garden theme where Hamlet in his first soliloquy informed us or reminded us that the world is an unweeded garden. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. The world is untended. Ophelia will come in carrying flowers, flowers that later she will then distribute in very interesting fashion because in the Elizabethan England of Shakespeare's day, flowers symbolized things. Let me give you one example. Ophelia has in her hand a daisy which she gives at this, in, this, in these scenes, which she gives to Gertrude, the queen. Doesn't mean anything until I tell you that the daisy was the Elizabethan symbol for infidelity. In other words, if you were a guy who thought your girlfriend or wife was messing around on you, you went out and bought a bunch of daisies and sent them to her. And when, she, when the daisies arrived, it wasn't, oh, hurrah, I've got flowers from my guy. It was an immediate observation, uh-oh, he knows, or at least he's accusing me of infidelity. Of course, it makes sense that Ophelia would be giving Gertrude the daisy, right, as being, as being of course, you know, to some degree, maybe, frailty thy name is woman, to echo what Hamlet said, too. Ophelia comes on stage doing what crazy people often do, muttering or talking, and in this case, singing to herself. Now the lines that she sings, these words that she speaks, written by Shakespeare, borrowings from popular, you know, little ditties and songs, are going to tell us something about why Ophelia is upset. Let's take a look at a couple of those lines and see just what it is she has to say in 4-5, for example. He is dead and gone, lady, he's dead and gone. At his head, a grass green turf, at his heels, a stone. Clearly, she, she's referencing the death here of her father. Maybe the imminent death of her lover, Hamlet, but certainly the death of her father, which will tell us the first reason why Ophelia's lost her mind. But the second set of lines are more intriguing and often not even said out loud in their entirety in public performances of this play because, especially at the high school level, they have a sexual rendering connotation that is a little more disturbing. Take a look at what she says here. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day. Sorry for those of you who know that St. Valentine's Day is something about getting little cards and writing your name on the back and handing them to other people to ask, will you be my Valentine? That's not at all, of course, in the history of Valentine's Day what we're talking about, a day in which which certain sexual acts can be committed and forgiven by the church. But notice the lines here. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day. Are you reading with me? You should be reading with me. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning betide. And I am made, that is to say a virgin, at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and dubbed, that means closed, the chamber door. That's called a bedroom door. Let in the maid a virgin that out a maid, that is to say a virgin, never departed more. Right? So you can get the sense here of Shakespeare's trying to have Ophelia say something. 
clearly this ain't got nothing to do with daddy. This will be the second reason Ophelia's loose in her mind. Her, her guy has left her. He's abandoned her. By gifts and by Saint Charity, a lack and five for shame, young men will do it if they come to it. By cock they are to blame. Now, you, you would have to be quasi-moronic to not be able to understand what these little lines maybe be gesturing towards. Quoth she before you tumbled me. Of course, here, the word tumbled having to do with the loss of virginity. You promised me to wed, so what I have done by yonder son, and thou hast not come to my bed. Seeming to suggest that Ophelia now really is completely alone. She is abandoned. The king will come on stage and say, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. We have a saying, when it rains, it pours. Right, right. In other words, you think it's going to get better, but it actually gets worse. And then, all of a sudden, Laertes shows up. Laertes is, of course, deeply offended, and he comes at the king with a drawn sword. Ironically, it's the queen who steps in between them and says, please don't hurt my husband. To which, ironically, and it's a dark irony, Claudius pushes her aside and says, Don't worry, Gertrude. There is a divinity that doth hedge a king. I am protected by a hedge because I'm a king. Nobody can hurt me. It's a bizarre irony that a man who assassinated his brother to gain the throne would say, Nobody can hurt me. And yet there's Claudius. He's, of course, speaking lines that would be kind of accepted by Shakespeare's audience as true. It's a major no-no to kill a king. And almost without exception in Shakespeare's plays, when a king is killed, what we call regicide, when it happens, it's usually not a good thing, but a bad thing. Think about the play Macbeth. Everything seems to be going very well in Scotland until, of course, Duncan, the old man, gets jacked. And then everything just seems to descend downward, right? Laertes is calmed by Claudius, when onto the stage comes Ophelia. And Ophelia's final words, good night, ladies, good night, sweet ladies, good night, lines that T.S. Eliot will quote again in his classic 1922 poem, Wasteland, final words, and then Ophelia will leave the stage and we'll never see her again. Scene six. A brief scene, and here's the problem. Shakespeare's created a problem for himself. Hamlet knows Claudius did it. Hamlet has to get revenge on Claudius. But the problem is, how does he get revenge? He's got to be somehow able to return back to Denmark. Why? Because he's on a ship sailing towards England with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Shakespeare will solve this problem by the following. While they were on their ship, we're not shown this, we're told this. While they were on their ship headed towards England, a pirate ship attacked them. In the process, Hamlet jumps onto the pirate ship and, it has, and, and is befriended by the pirates. He must have told them what went down in regards to the murder of his father. And the pirates then left Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and the other ship and allowed them to continue towards, uh, towards England. Hamlet, however, is now coming back towards Denmark on this ship with these pirates. In 4-6, four, in four, a, a brief observation here is made in the form of a letter to Horatio from Hamlet that says, Look for me, I'm soon to return. Finally, 4-7. At the end of the fourth act, we have an interesting conversation between the king and Laertes. Laertes will have finished 4-5 by say. It's not so much that my daddy got killed by Hamlet that I'm so upset about. It's that he had such a quiet funeral, no ostentation. That word meaning show. In other words, Laertes is, is upset his daddy died, but he's even more upset. His father was not given a formal funeral of any kind. He wants to know why. In 4-7, uh, in we're going to find out why. The answer is simple. Claudius says, look, here's the problem. I couldn't just go out and jack Hamlet. Two reasons. One, he's loved by the distracted multitude. The people of Denmark like this kid. They think he's a hero, and if I had executed him, it would have been bad on me. But more importantly, number two, his mama likes him. 
He's, uh, you know, he's pretty close with his mom, and if I had killed him, I'd have had problems with his mom. And to that degree, there's issues. So I had to let him go. But don't worry, he says. Uh, I'm, I'm letting England take care of it. Onto the stage comes a guy carrying a letter that says, Hamlet's coming back to Denmark. And it's at that point, Claudius will immediately invent a new plan. He will say to Laertes, what are your thoughts about Hamlet's return? To which Laertes is, says, dude, whatever we can do to jack this kid, that's what we're going to do. It's at that point, for your notes, Claudius engages in a little bit of interesting rhetorical flattery. He's able to convince Laertes that recently there's been this famous French soldier who came and performed at court on his horse, swinging his sword around, acting like he's killing things and the like. And he was really good, Claudius says. But when he heard that Laertes, Polonius' son, was actually from our castle, he said Laertes was the best fighter he had ever seen. The truth of this is dubious. We probably believe it to be made up, but it works. Claudius will pause for a second, and he'll say, uh, you know, that's, that, th th there may be a plan here. To which Laertes is like, plan, plan, let's put a plan together. And then all of a sudden, Claudius looks at Laertes and says, uh, Laertes, was your father dear to you? In other words, did you love your dad? Laertes, interestingly, doesn't say yes. Rather, Laertes says, why are you asking me that? Claudius says, oh, because... There's something I understand about love. Now, this is an echo of lines earlier. You'll remember that Hamlet said, man, my dad's been dead two whole months, and his name is completely forgotten. That's why people build towns and name them after themselves, or build buildings and name them after themselves. In other words, how quickly people forget. Claudius will ask Laertes, did you really love your dad? And Laertes will be like, why'd you ask me that? And now I'm with you uh, in 4-7 uh, at roughly line 110 or so. The king says, not that I think you did not love your father, but that I know love is begun by time. Now, everyone who's ever been in love, everyone who ever imagined falling in love and then supposedly living with that individual with whom he or she was in love with for a long time, is going to take pause at these lines. Take a look at what Claudius says about love and falling in love. He says, And that I see in passages of proof, time qualifies the spark and fire of it. There lives within the very flame of love a kind of wick or snuff that will abate it, and nothing is it a light goodness still, for growing, for goodness growing to a pleurisy dies in its own too much. Now, what exactly does that mean? Simple. Love is a fire. Okay? And there is no such thing as the eternal flame. Fires inevitably go out. So if love is a flame, buried within the very nature of fire is the reality. Sooner or later, it, it, it goes away, right? Uh, in other words, yet there's not enough to burn forever. And because that's the case, you love passionately, hard, strong, but then it goes away. He says, I kind of think that's the way love is, right? That, look what he says next. These are maybe the most interesting lines of the fourth act. That we should do, I'm sorry, that we would do, we should do when we would. For this would changes and hath abatements and delays as many as there are tongues or hands or accidents. And then this should is like a spendthrift sigh. Now go back and put this down in your notes and you can just do the first few words and it'll be easy to remember. That Notice he says, we would do. All right, I'm going to call her. I'm going to call her because I'm definitely going to ask her out. I'm definitely going to ask her out. I'm definitely, okay, that we would do, we should do when we would. For that would hath abatements and delays. Okay, I'm going to call her. I'm definitely going to call her. I'm going to call her right now. I'm picking up the phone. Watch me dialing. I'm actually dialing four, three, one. Wait a second. First of all, I need to think about this for just a second. Probably busy. I'm guessing, uh, definitely no, she, definitely no busy. Busy is definitely, two hours is all I need. Two hours, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for a little run or something. I'm going to come back. Uh, three hours is even better. That's getting close. Tomorrow more, I'm definitely going tomorrow at noon. Tomorrow in the afternoon. Afternoon of tomorrow, okay, I made up my mind tomorrow late afternoon, early evening. You know what? The weekend probably is the better time. I'm going to, see how this works? That we should do 
that we would do, we should do when we would. Now, why would Claudius say this to Laertes? What is it that Claudius is going to want Laertes to do? Yeah, he, Claudius doesn't want to kill his own stepson because he's got to live with his wife. The easy thing to do is to set it up so that Laertes kills, Claude, kill, kills Hamlet. Notice the, the lines to follow. Um, he says, but to the quick of the ulcer, Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words? In other words, notice the, the, the continuation of this seeming theme. You seem like you're really upset about your father being murdered by Hamlet. But are you really? Let's ask you if you're willing to prove it. What are you willing to do to prove it? Notice what Laertes says. Did you read it? He says, dude, I would cut his throat in the church. Woo. In other words, I'd commit murder in the church, which means I'd be willing to damn myself to hell. I'd cut his throat in the church. But look at what the king says. This is the same king who, when he was on his knees, had that blade sitting right over his head held by Hamlet. Remember that? And Hamlet was ready to kill him while he was praying. But, of course, Hamlet said, dude, I'm not going to kill him while he's praying because his soul will go to heaven. Up, sword, no a more horrid hint. Look what the king says to Laertes. Oh, no place indeed should murder sanctuaries. Revenge should have no bounds. What does he say to Laertes? No, 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 no. We don't want to cut his throat in a church. Why? Yeah, you kill him in a church, Hamlet's soul goes to heaven. Dude, we got to kill him outside of a church so that when you slit his throat, Hamlet's soul goes to hell. Brutal. Brutal. So Claudia is playing the same game Hamlet was playing earlier. Revenge needs to have no bounds. You got to have sweet revenge, in other words. How to get revenge? Simple. We're going to set up a sword fight. The sword fight has simple rules to it. Now, you need to understand, this is kind of like fencing. It's not like they're actually fighting to try and kill each other, but rather to have a touch. In the French language, it's touche. So maybe you've heard about this in, fan, in fencing, where you, you work with your sword until you actually touch a padded shirt or, t or front, and the minute that you touch, you've got points. This is all about family honor stuff, okay? Laertes can maintain family honor. However, it's a simple observation. He says, this is what we're going to do. The swords that we use have a point, a blunt on them, so they're not pokey. They're not sharp. But Hamlet, he says, is too young and stupid, and he's naive. He won't study the swords. So we're going to take your point off, right? And then while you're sword fighting, you'll just stick it right into his chest. Of course, it's going to go right into him. Done. Well, well, I've jacked him that way. Perfect. And then Claudius thinks for a second, goes, wait a second, you know... Uh, what else can we do? Laertes says, oh, I got a better plan. How about this? I've got some poison that I will put on the blade. So all I have to do is just nick him. I don't even have to really cut him bad. And the poison will go into his blood. He'll be dead in no time. Great idea. Claudius says, hmm, not bad. Un, un, uh, you know, unbaited point, poison on the blade. Let's think about one other option. We'll do poison in the cup as well. Laertes and Claudius want to make sure Hamlet's definitely going down. Okay, there's no question, no doubt about it. He will buy the farm. In the meantime, Mama shows up. And let's go to it now at the very end of Act 4. The queen shows up and uh, she says, One woe, I'm at line 165 or so, One woe doth tread upon another's heel, so fast they follow. When sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions, when it rains, it pours. In other words, the queen says, something bad has really happened. Your sisters drowned, Laertes. Laertes drowned? Where? And the queen will then say how it is that it was reported anyway, Ophelia has drowned herself. There is a willow grows a slant of brook, Shakespeare liked willows. For those of you who like to study this kind of thing, go and look at the play uh, Othello. And at the very end of that play, Desdemona will even sing songs as she's about to be murdered. She will sing songs about a willow that grows next to a brook. There is a willow grows a slant, a brook that shows his hoar leaves in the grassy stream. There with fantastic garlands, flowers, did she make of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples, that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them there. On the pendant boughs, her cornet weeds clamoring to hang, on curvy silver broke, 
went down her weedy trophies at herself, fell in the weeping brook. Dude, anybody can say. Ophelia was picking flowers by the side of the river and she fell in and drowned. It takes a poet to be able to say it the way Shakespeare just said it. She was picking flowers by the side of the river. Gave way. She fell in. She slipped. She fell in to the water. Her clothes spread wide and mermaid-like, reminding us that Hamlet earlier will have called Ophelia a nymph. A while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress or like a creature native and endued unto that element, like a mermaid. But long it could not be till that her garments heavy with their drink pull the poor wretch from her melodious lay to murky death. She just lays back into the water, floats for a while. The large garment dress that she would be wearing will slowly fill with water and down she sinks and that's the end of Ophelia. Ophelia's death then is going to be the low mark of our play because Ophelia is the great innocent who has done nothing to deserve the terrible, terrible end of her life. Of course, Laertes was calmed by Claudius, but now Laertes is ready to go jack somebody. Little sister now is dead as well as father because of one man, right? The namesake of our play, Hamlet. And of course, at this point, for Shakespeare's audience, it's a very difficult thing to still be rooting entirely for Hamlet, right? Because Hamlet's actions have created some of the terrible negative ripple effects, as we might say. Act five, let's go to it. The fifth act is a brilliantly constructed act in response to the high drama, dare we say it, the negative energy at the end of the fourth act. Are you ready for this? We end with the death of Ophelia at the end of act four, we open Act 5, Scene 1, in a graveyard. Now, I need to explain this to you, so I'll be on my whiteboard, so you have some sense of what we're talking about. In uh, England, of Shakespeare's day, one of the great challenges was how you bury people. One or two great anthropologists have pointed out, if you want to know anything about a culture, study two things. One, what they do at, a, at an infant's birth. Two, what they do in death in the form of funerals. You know a lot about a culture when you know that. In Europe, the way it worked was simply this way most of the time. You had a church building that was kind of constituted as the center for the community of religious gathering. Right outside of the church building, you had a plot of ground that was for burial, okay? And then out beyond that, you had an even larger plot of ground that was for more burial, okay? This, inside of the church, there were burials, but those were for the most sacred, right? So, for example, remember, Chaucer tells us that in Canterbury Tales, people travel to Canterbury to that huge cathedral because inside of the church is where Thomas Becket's body lays, right, in, 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 a, in a sarcophagus and all of that, right? Right outside of the church in this area is where your good Christians are buried, and then the rest who are maybe not so good Christians are buried in common burial ground. Now, the way they buried was to just dig uh, a trench in the ground, in the dirt, and then they just put the body in the ground. Got me? Most of the time, they didn't even use a, uh, you know, a coffin or anything. And then you just buried, 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 side by side. And you did this all the way until you got to right there. When you got to right there, you didn't go find another plot of ground. England is a small, physically small country. So you couldn't go find more ground. What you did is you just went back up to the top left corner, and then you just started doing it again. Digging holes, bury, 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 all the way to here. And then when you got, went back up here again. Now the challenge, of course, with this idea is that during times of great death, like the plague, for example, you could go through this plot of ground easily in a matter of, few, of a few months. Easily. Which is why when the torrential rainstorms happened, as they always do in Europe, 
It would not be unusual in the morning to walk past a graveyard and you could literally see parts of bodies sticking out of the ground. It was also not unusual at all when you were digging these graves to come across bones of prior inhabitants. That was not unusual at all, which is, of course, why a grave digger's job was considered one of the lowliest, right? Because you had to deal with decomposition of corpses as you were digging uh, the, the new graves, right? And of course, that was kind of a gross, uh, gross uh, job to have. Look where we start, Act 5, Scene 1. Where are we? We are in a graveyard, absolutely. And Shakespeare intentionally calls his grave digger clowns. Are you ready for this? Act 5, Scene 1 begins with comedy. Comedy. <laughs> Joking. You've got two grave diggers who are drinking ale and they're digging a grave. Got me? Now Shakespeare wants to drive the point home and so one of the ways he did this at his Globe was to drop a little bit of his stage down so that one of those guys is in there and, he's, and you can only see him from the waist up. He's got his shovel and Shakespeare put a mound of dirt there so the guy's doing one of these things where he's kind of pulling, right? And then he had gone and got some bones. Real human bones, including skulls. It's highly significant that one of those is a real skull. Because here in a little bit, in the most iconic moment in this entire play, the young man Hamlet's going to pick up one of those skulls and he's going to hold it in his hand. Let's make some observations now about Act 5. And I'll, I'll, of course, I'll finish with Act 5 on Monday then. In the fifth act, Hamlet has been marching towards death in the entire play. We started with the death of his father and his ghost. We now come to Act 5. And what I want to say about Act 5 is that it looks something kind of like this, okay? Where you have concentric boxes, maybe you might think, or circles, all right? Where the center, you would write the word death, okay? And in each one of the events that happen in Act 5, Hamlet takes it one step closer to death. Do you got me? He starts far on the outside. And every time he takes one step closer, then one step closer, then one step closer, until finally, at the very end of the play, he himself is lying on stage, mortally wounded and soon to die. Let's watch how that works. The opening lines of Act 5, Scene 1, will posit two grave diggers. Take a look at how it opens. Is she to be buried in Christian burial that willfully seeks her own salvation? Whoa, whoa, whoa. They ain't but two she's in this play. Who are they? The queen and Hamlet's girl. What are these two cats doing? They're at the graveyard digging a grave. A grave for who? This is Ophelia's grave. But the question is, is she to be buried here instead of here? Right? Right? Why would she be buried here instead of here? It's right there in the opening. She committed suicide. She offed herself. Yeah. In other words, she didn't, she didn't just lay back nymph-like and, and drown. She actually willfully jumped into that water and drowned herself. The first question is, dude, why are we digging another grave in a Christian burial for a woman who drowned herself? The second one will say, I tell you she is, and therefore make her grave straight. In other words... Dude, we just do what we're told, and what we're told is to dig her a grave in Christian burial, right? Then the, then the, the clowns start joking back and forth about be, having the oldest profession. Because sooner or later, everybody dies, and that means everybody's got to be buried. Grave diggers are some of the oldest, the oldest profession in the world, right? They make jokes back and forth. When onto the stage walks Hamlet and Horatio. Let's point out something. Hamlet has no idea that he's standing next to his girl's grave. None. He's got no idea. Secondly, the grave diggers have no idea they're talking to Hamlet. They know who Hamlet is. In fact, one of them will say, Hamlet got sent away. They just don't know that the one they're saying this to is in fact Hamlet. Really? He got sent away where? To England. How come? Because he went crazy. 
Well, why'd they send him to England? Oh, it's okay. In England, they're all mad. They won't even notice that he's mad there because in England, everybody's crazy. Shakespeare's audience love lines like this when Shakespeare could make fun of his own, you know, of his own culture, right? As this grave digger is digging, a skull comes out of the grave and rolls across the stage to Hamlet's feet. He picks the skull up, again, in the most iconic, that is to say, most representative, iconic moment of the play. He actually holds in his hand a real human skull. And the grave digger will say, I know whose that is. It's an old court jester named Yorick. Hamlet goes, Yorick? The old court jester, the guy who was brought in to make everybody laugh? The laugh of the party, the highlight of the party when he was alive. He said, when I was a kid, Yorick was my favorite guy in the king's court, my dad's court. He would always do fun stuff. The grave digger said, yeah, once he poured a whole thing of wine on top of my head and everybody laughed about it. And all of a sudden, Hamlet's like, whoa, this is the guy who threw me on his back when I was a young kid, flew me around the, the courtroom and stuff. This is him? This is Yorick. And he holds holds the skull and looks at it. And he says to the skull, where are your jokes now? You used to be a joker. Quite chap fallen. Uh -huh. Come back on Monday, we'll finish.